chapter number two, I want to jump right into the message here today as we consider this thought of fear not. Fear not. In the Bible, you'll find in three separate times, the angels came and said those exact words to different people. And we'll see that today. Luke chapter number two, notice if you would, in verse number one, the Bible says that it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Some things never change. <laughs> and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one, into his own city. By, by the way, this is even future, if you want to talk about prophecy, eschatology, that you really an upcoming international revenue service uh, tax, the kingdom of the Antichrist, Revelation 13, which we'll study in our prophecy series coming in March. Talking a little bit, this also has a future uh, implication as well. There, there's, another, there's another one coming. Uh, anyway, but praise God, if you're saved, you won't be here. What verse was I on? I was on verse 3. Okay, Joseph went up uh, uh, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house in the lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore, what? Verse 10, And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. I thank you for your word that you preserved for us so we can know you. I thank you for the Spirit of God when we get saved that lives and dwells in us and leads us and guides us. And I pray today that you will use this message, this simple thought of fear not, to be a help and to be a comfort to folks that are here today. I pray if there's somebody not saved today that they'll trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and will thank you for it and give you the glory for it's in Christ's name we pray and amen. amen. This time of year being Christmas time, holidays, really starting in Thanksgiving to Christmas to, to New Year's, can be, for many people, can be a can be a stressful time. It can be a time of all kinds of anxiety, uh, unknowns, fears, for many different reasons. And they're many times different with different people. Uh, parties, uh, the, the cooking, the shopping, uh, getting the perfect gift, uh, purchasing gifts for your kids, which when I was thinking about it this year, one particular church uh, in the book of Revelation came to mind with my kids, and it's, it's a church that says this, increased with goods and in need of nothing. So that was kind of my way of saying hold on the stocking is, is coming up. Shopping for the perfect gift. And then there's the, there, there's the Christmas tree battle. I just need to say this, I'm kind of, not venting, but i got to say this, that, you know, fake tree or real tree. It's just, I'm going to give a, a confession. Did they say confession is good for the soul? I gave in about five years ago. For 20 years, we had, let's go cut a tree. And now I've got, I hate, I would like saying it, I've got a fake tree in my house. Now, here's the dirty little secret about fake trees that nobody wants to talk about. Once you get a fake tree, maybe you're feeling festive for one particular, hey, let's just go get it, let's go cut down a tree, let's go get a tree. 
No, 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 we've already got one. So you're stuck with that tree. And then they sell you this can of, you know, evergreen spray, so it smells, it doesn't work. And they still have needles. <laughs> then there's the Christmas lights, plastic clips, the nails, getting on the ladder when you're older. Yeah. Every neighbor, and then there's the, every neighborhood has the guy who leaves them up all year long. <laughs> Don't raise your hand and say that's you. Then I'm just going to say this real quick. Got to put, then there's the decorating of the tree. Now, you may not have this battle at your house, but I've got it in mind. Every year, but friend, I'm looking. I'm looking. There's one particular ornament that I'm looking for. And I'm like, Mary, where is that? She said, you ask it right here. It's gone. <laughs> I'm, when I was in kindergarten, I made a Frosty the Snowman with marshmallows. <laughs> And I'm like, what in the way? And I just, every year, what, what are you talking about? It's gone. You look every year. So what I did is I reached out to my dad. And I said, as any dad, good dad would do, he dug in the attic. And I'm going to tell you, guess what he did for his son? He found it. <laughs> I'm 49. I know I don't look it. Don't aim at that. 40, 44 years ago, I'm going to tell you right now, he found it, and there it is. Right there. <laughs> That's mine! I need that! <laughs> and of course, my dad puts caution tape and hats back all around it. But Curtis, that's my dad. That's my, anyway, there it is. That's mine! Say to you today, right here. <laughs> and it's going on the tree. Man, that feels good. Of course, he. Now I'm going to put it on the tree and I'm going to walk outside. It's going to be like a tree outside or whatever, but I've got it. If you want to come see it, you can see it afterwards. You can touch it. It's not just when you, I mean, this is 45 years old. You eat something and then there it is still alive. It's, it's still squishy. Okay. Sorry, Brooke Jones. I just, I had, I get sometimes confessions given because I had to get that out there. My dad found it and I got it and I'm going to use it. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and then I just, just real quick, talk about just things at Christmas. Like if you have your own little battles, ours is one of them is a Christmas card every year, and that's a battle. But another one is I want to say this to any guy that just got married in here. And you say to your wife, you know, well, what do you want? And she says, she says, oh, I don't really want anything. Yeah. <laughs> She's lying. <laughs> she is lying to you. <laughs> So you better write it down and make a note. Not from experience, like I, okay, you said you didn't want anything. Not like I've heard from experience. But anyway, so there's that going on. And where do we go for Christmas? And your family's your wife. And then how long are we going to stay? And all the things that go on during Christmas. In reality, as you see in the Bible, there is a word that comes up, a phrase that comes up multiple times. And the word that comes up, the phrase is, fear not. Fear not. We're going to see some things today. I, I think will be helpful to you when it comes to that subject. Now, Christmas, we know it can be complicated, bring out all kinds of fears. Many fear not having enough money to meet everybody's needs and meals and who's going to be there and who's not. But three times the angels appeared. Three times they spoke the same words: "Fear not." Now, notice in your notes, if you would, we see our first thought, and that is this: Fear not. Fear not when you are caught off guard when you're caught off guard. Now I had to, this doesn't always happen, but I had to actually, I had to apply this right away to myself this week. Just to tell you really briefly here, a little, uh, uh, not a rabbit trail, a controlled parenthetical, and this is what happened. So this week, so my wife, you know, so my daughter's home from college. She was, my daughter was in the earlier service, Rebecca, and she's home from college. Well, Come home from college, you're here five weeks. Mom says, you know, get a job. That's what you do. You're not sitting on your phone for five weeks, you're going to work. 
And that's Mary's hobby is work. And so she says, you're going to get a job. And so she says, okay, all right, I get a job. And her generation, then they get their phone, they start, you know, tweeting out and contacting and whatever. Next thing you know, she says the next day, dad, I got a job. I said, awesome. What is it? She says, I got a job with a company called Rover. And I said, well, what is that? She says, that is where do that we are now going to house sit <laughs> dogs and cats. We don't have any animals. I love animals, but we don't have any animals. So I'm saying, OK, hey, well, how bad can it be? Hey, we're going to run to the mall. Could you watch the job? We're driving down the road. We're on our way to work. True story. This is, I was on the way to the office, and it was just Becky and I in the car, and Mary and Michael were following. And we're she said, I've got one right here. They want us to watch their dog December 21st to December 27th. Whoa. I said, like, like the whole time, like at our house, living there, being there through Christmas. Yes. And you've got to respond right away. And they want you to respond right away. I said, wait five minutes so we can talk to mom. <laughs> wait. Okay, okay. You've got to respond. Wait. God is my witness. For Curtis, two minutes later, she said, my finger bumped the button. <laughs> And I'm like, what did you do? She says, no, it's not going to be that yet. It's going to be great. Here's a picture. I'm looking at like this five foot great game roof that's just coming in your house. So Rufus, uh, truth, truth be known, Kona, Kona, who's a beautiful dog, is at our house now. We've got the dog. Rufus came later, but it just sounded better. But you get the point. I was completely caught off guard. You know, sometimes in your life, you can be caught off guard, and you're like, what do I do? Well, look, at, you want to talk about caught off guard. Look at, look at Luke chapter 1. Just turn one page over. I'm going to show you something here that, that will really... I think stand out to all of us. Luke 1, look at verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house, uh, the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when he saw him, and she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation, salutation this should be. And I want you to notice verse 30. And the angel said unto her, what's the next two words? Well, none of us can, can this is at another level, right? Now, we can get caught off guard. So time out for a minute. Imagine what's going through her mind. This is, by the way, this is not fictitious. This actually happened. And there's Mary. Like, what, 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 what in the world? And it says, if you look at the verse, it says that she was troubled. Mary's life was peaceful prior to the angel showing up. Gabriel appears. She's probably 14 or 15 years old. No doubt, like any young lady, she's dreaming of, I have been her whole life, dreaming of this beautiful wedding. She's engaged to a man by the name of Joseph. They're about to get married. And according to the text, she had maintained her sexual purity. She had maintained her spiritual purity. A bright future awaiting her. And then the next thing you know, she's completely caught off guard. When the angel makes the announcement to Mary, her life was completely turned upside down. Mary's called upon to bear shame. And, and reproach and humiliation. Why? For the glory of God. Think about it for a minute. This, this, this basically can be, is, is one of the greatest uh, honors uh, that afforded to a woman, but at the same time, can you imagine it carried with it a little bit of social stigma? What are people thinking? When our lives don't go as planned, you know, sometimes it's easy to fear the unknown. I don't really know what the future holds. But God many times can use that to grow us. And many times we end up seeing a miracle. 
in the end. I want to share with you, if I can, uh, a, a brief story that I believe will illustrate this point. There was a, a young couple, and they were called upon to go to Brooklyn, New York, to reestablish a, a local church that had kind of went under. They arrived in October. They were there excited to get this thing up and going and off the ground, but a lot of work needed to be done. So they set a goal that on, on Christmas Eve, they worked from October to Christmas Eve, that would be their very first service. So they started repairing things and fixing things up and fixing the walls and fixing the pews, and they were a little bit ahead of schedule. Then on December 19th, a storm hit the area, lasted a couple days, and on the 21st of December, the pastor went down to the church. And when he got there, there was a, a leak in the, in the roof, a whole big thing had fallen off the wall, landed in front of the pulpit. The pastor's cleaning up the mess. He's not even knowing what to do but to postpone Christmas, the special Christmas Eve service. So he goes home, he's getting ready to tell his wife what's going on. On the way home, he noticed a local business was having a flea market, a really a, 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 a sale for charity. So he stopped in, and one of the items that he purchased was a, was a beautiful, handmade, crocheted uh, tablecloth with a, a nice embroidery right in the middle with a cross. Just the perfect size to fix the big hole there at the church. He bought it, he went back to the church, and as he was driving back, it started snowing again. And as he was going, he saw an elderly lady that was running in the opposite direction. She had missed her bus. So he said to the lady, why don't you just come on in? Your next bus doesn't come for 45 minutes. Why don't you sit in the church and just wait here? It's warm inside till the bus comes. Well, she says, okay. So he goes about his stuff, fixing the church up, puts the tablecloth up, covers the hole. The lady's sitting there. And she starts walking down the middle aisle, and she's looking at him and looking at that embroidered tablecloth, kind of like she had just seen a ghost. She says to the pastor, where did you get that? He says, I bought it from the flea market. There was a sale for charity. And she says, would you look in the right corner and see if the initials EBG are embroidered in there? And sure enough, it was. And she looked at him and said, I used to live in Austria. 35 years ago, I made that. I made that. My husband and I, she said, were well-to-do in Austria. And when the Nazis came in, and we had to leave, I said to my husband, I've got to evacuate. I will see you. And, and her husband said, I'll see you in one week afterwards. Well, her husband got arrested. And she fled. And she, and she never saw her husband again for 35 years. Well, the pastor insisted on driving her home. He said, I'll give you the tablecloth. She says, no, you keep it. So, kept it. He drives her home. She lived on the other side of Staten Island. She was only in Brooklyn for one day because she had a house cleaning job. So he took her home. What a wonderful Christmas Eve service that they had. People shaking hands at the door, said it was a great spirit. They loved the music. They said they'd come back. And as the service is over, he walks into the sanctuary and he looks and there's a, an elderly man sitting on the front row staring at the tablecloth says to the pastor, where did you get that? Tells the story. He said, well, my wife and I were well-to-do in Austria. 35 years ago, the Nazis came in, and he tells the same exact story. The pastor said, do you mind if I take you for a little ride? He says, sure. And they drove from Staten Island to the same house where the pastor had taken the woman three days earlier. Helped the man climb up three flights of stairs, knocked on the door, and witnessed the greatest Christmas reunion you could ever imagine. And I say all that to say this. Sometimes in life, and I think many of you can attest to this, things don't always go as we planned them. They don't. Do, do, do you think for one second that Mary actually thought this is what's going to happen? Life throws us all kinds of curveballs that we don't accept, that we don't expect. But many times there's a silver lining in them and God works out things in the end. 
Would you glance down and just notice in your notes, and I want you to notice the second time when the angels appear. Fear not when you don't when you're caught off guard, but secondly, fear not when you don't know what to do. Look at Matthew. Turn over just a couple pages, and it's also in your notes, and they'll have it on the screen. But Matthew chapter 1, and look at verse 18. Perfect example, Joseph, like Mary, was on the way to have it all that a Jewish man could ask for in that day. He's about to be married to a, a beautiful, a righteous Jewish girl. And then came the news that shattered his life and brought his dreams and his hopes crashing down. Look at verse chapter 1, look at verse 18. The Bible says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she found him with child of the Holy Ghost. Then her, her, Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But when he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, notice again, say the next words with me, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now again, I told you earlier service that you know time out. I said do I get I get three timeouts per message. And so imagine Joseph. So you have Mary and now you got Joseph. And you talk about a curveball. You talk about really not knowing what to do. But the Bible says that he was a just man. Not willing to, to make her an example. Not willing to, you know, uh, make a scene of the situation. He was a just man. No doubt caught off guard. No doubt not really sure what to do. You know, what, what, he really had two options. He could divorce Mary quietly and <clears throat> send her away until the baby was born. He could have made her, made her a public example and, and openly did it. And, and nobody would have understood it. And matter of fact, according to Deuteronomy... 24, she would have been stoned. She would have been killed. Yes. Had he done that, Joseph's life was turned upside down. Now I can't stand here to say, stand here today and say, well, you know, we have all faced similar situations. <laughs> no, we haven't. But we've all had life bring us curveballs and things that come our way that we weren't really expecting. And let me just say this: sometimes when it happens, we don't really know what to do. You thought you had everything lined up. You thought you had it planned out very well. Then comes the curveball. By the way, I just need to say this. Nobody is exempt. That's, let that sink in. Nobody's exempt. It's always the other one. No, no, no. Be mindful of the fact that everyone that can hear me right now, we all can get things that just don't go, don't go as we planned. But we maybe don't know what to do. There, there's a book I encourage you to read. Uh, it's written by a, a lady, and uh, it's titled Managing Your Expectations. Because sometimes our expectations are like this. We've got it all planned out. But it doesn't always go as we've got it all planned out. For me or for you. Mary had it all planned out. She knew what she knew. Joseph had it all planned out. And life comes in and changes. Imagine Job. Imagine, do you think he was caught off guard? <laughs> it can happen to any of us. Joseph finds out that he's the man who God chose to raise the Messiah. Uh, listen carefully. The Lord's assignments are, are many times costly. But don't miss this. Sometimes God calls you to do something and it'll cost you something. But it always gives back far more than it ever requires of us. Now let that sink in. I'll explain kind of what I mean. Sometimes people get the mindset, well, yeah, you know, that's for people in the ministry. Those are, that's for missionaries, <laughs> pastors. And no, By the way, let's get past this, Brother Rick. Let's get past this. We're all ministers. All of us. We're all ministers. Every, we're all, in, let me say this, we're all in the ministry. You, we have to, there's a, there's a, there's a, I think something that's fatal in Christendom is the onus, or, or what's presented that 
that, you know, we're not all in the ministry. We're all in the ministry. You walk out those doors, you're going into the mission field. You're missionaries. Praise God. It's just we have different parts in the body. But I want to say this. When God calls you to do something, many times it costs you something. But it always pays great dividends. Can I say it like this? It pays to serve God. It pays to serve God. Doesn't mean there won't be bumps in the road. Doesn't mean there will be, won't be challenges. Doesn't mean there won't be hardships. Joseph accepted. You know, Joseph could have done anything. He accepted the call. And by the way, thank God, thank the Lord that he chooses, I love this, common men. Sometimes people say, you know what, but if so and so would just get saved, Brother Halliday, that would be amazing. Man, if you look at the platform they have, God doesn't need that platform. He's not looking to, you know, have to have this, this guy got saved. God chooses common men to do the work of the ministry. It's that simple. Matter of fact, you read your Bible, you will find, look at the 12 disciples. Brother Gary, they're ordinary men, right? Read, read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. God's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God's chosen the base things of the world. God's chosen the things that are despised. God's chosen the things that are not. Why? Why is that? Verse 29 in, in 1 Corinthians 1. So no flesh will glory in His presence. God doesn't want anybody to take His glory. It's His. One thing Pastor Blue taught me and instilled in me and maybe it was because of his humble upbringings in Arkansas, living in packing sheds in Wenatchee as a kid, that uh, anything God, if God ever uses you in any way, shape, or form, you be careful to give him the glory. Even if it's a little Nehemiah prayer, and you're just saying, Lord, I, if somebody says, that was a great song, Oh, what a blessing. That was a great lesson that you taught. Lord, thank you. Thank you. It's His glory. Amen? Amen? It's His glory. Thirdly and lastly, notice, fear not when you are overwhelmed. How many of you, from time to time, if you were honest, say, I've been overwhelmed before. Say amen. amen. Look at Luke chapter 2. And this, this will be the last verse we see. Luke chapter 2. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Chapter 2, notice if you would, verse 8. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. The Bible says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And I love this, I love this. So they're freaked out, they're overwhelmed, not sure what to do. Here's the shepherds, like, what in the world is going on here? Angel said unto them, What's the next two words? Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. When the shepherds heard the message of the angel, they reacted with fear. But eventually, and don't miss this, their fear led to their salvation. It really did. They're, they're overwhelmed. They're freaked out. It says that they were so afraid. But ultimately, it led to their salvation. And so it is with us. Sometimes many people, they fear even the hearing of the gospel. You know, when you, your, your friends at work, your co-workers, your neighbors, your relatives, people you've been praying for, when you invite them to church, when you tell them to come to church, don't, you may not because you're comfortable here, but you, you understand, many people fear walking into a local assembly. Yeah. They just do. There's, there's preconceived notions that they already have about places like this. And then, unfortunately, they come here and sometimes I confirm them. But anyway. <laughs> but I'm just being transparent. I, I have a friend that I worked with at Costco for years. 
And uh, I, I've witnessed to them so many times. I've given them preaching CDs. I've, I mean, I have the kind of relationship that I can go up to them and say, hey, have you got saved yet? When are you going to get saved? You know, we have that kind of relationship. But I'll never forget he said something to me. Just probably 12 years ago he said this to me. And I'll never forget it. He said, I've been to church a couple times. And every time I walk into church, he says, my, my palms get all sweaty. I understand that. You know what that is sometimes? That is the, that is the conviction of knowing really what you need to do. And there's fear there. But don't you understand that if we can get past our fears, even as it, they did in the text, it led to their salvation? And may we be mindful of that as we share our faith. Three times, look at the text, the angels came. Three times the reaction was based on fear, and three times the same thing was said. Fear not. So it is in the Christmas season. You may have things you fear. Learn from Mary. Learn from Joseph. Learn from the shepherds. Let, let God take your fear, turn it into joy. There was an elderly man that was asked this question, and I quote, what was it that through your life that robbed you most of your joy? You know what he said? He said, the things that never happened. Now, I want to say it again so you guys can fully get it. What robbed you of your joy most of the time? He said, the things that never happened. You know what, some of you sitting here today, you know what, your, your joy is sucked out of you. Why? Because you're worried about things that haven't even happened yet. Now, now I, I live there. I mean, listen, I have to be prepared. My last name's Murphy. So, it, it's, you know, with me, I've got to be able to... I, I, said, I said to Pastor Kennedy, I said, you know, we he's talking about the facelift upstairs, doing some things, doing some sanctuary up, and I said, it's kind of scary. Things are going really smooth. We're on schedule. And I said, this cannot be good because you have, you have the Kennedy curse and you have Murphy's Law. So something's got to go south. And so... But, but, but in reality, many people, their joy is sucked from them because they're worried about things that haven't even happened yet. Worry is like a rocking chair. It will keep you busy, but you're not going anywhere. I don't know how it is with you this morning, but this message, simple thought, three times in the Bible, it's stated, fear not. It doesn't have to be Christmas. It doesn't have to be, well, I'm not really worried about the holidays. You may be here today and you've got some fear inside of you, fear of the unknown. If you were caught off guard, maybe life threw you a curveball. I, it could be a whatever. Now, God knows what it is. I don't know what it is. God knows. But my advice to you is this. What's the opposite of fear? Trust. He holds the whole world in his hands, does he not? I, I told the early service, I have a lot of weaknesses. I've got a lot of insecurities. I have a lot of things that I struggle with. One thing that, for whatever reason, has been kind of easier for me is just to trust God with whatever. I just trust him. I want to encourage you to remember the fact, again, he has the whole world in his hands. He's sovereign. He has your best interest at heart, life throws us a curveball, continue to trust Him. Don't fear, trust Him. And no doubt, it'll all work out in the end. We say, how do you know that? Because all things, I don't care if you say, well, you people just use that verse. All things, the Bible says, work together for good to those that love God, to those that are the called according to His purpose. When you're making a cake, if you just take part of the ingredients and start eating it, not very good, is it? Once that thing gets together, when you make that gluten-free carrot cake, I've gained like 
three pounds from that thing. It's like, they're so dense, gluten-free is like really heavy. But I'll tell you what, when it's all together, it's good, isn't it? That's what God does with our lives sometimes. It just kind of works it together for good, for His glory. Cast all your care upon Him. He cares for you.